As Andrew said, I, I wanted to talk a little bit today about what kind of tools we heard uh, the producer perspective about one of the modeling tools we have. So a little general information, what kind of tools are out there? How are they being used? You know, what are some of the things they do, don't do well? You know, how to distinguish between them a little bit? I wanted to talk about one of the tools that we've been working on, the Apple model. Um, to try to give a perspective about, you know, what are the values of, of these models, how they ought to be used. Okay, there it goes. So, you know, we heard a lot about ag P loss. Then we've heard a lot about, well, if we want to know how much, where, well, it depends, right? It depends on a lot of things. How much phosphorus is in the soil? What's the chemistry of that phosphorus in the soil? How much phosphorus are you applying in manure fertilizer? How are you applying it? What's the chemistry of that application? You know, then we get into transport. What's my hydrology? Um, what's my erosion? So there's a lot of different factors that go into how much phosphorus is going to leave a field. So when, we, when you see all that complexity, you start to say, well, you know, well, then how much phosphorus am I losing? How much is agriculture really contributing? You know, what can producers do to, to decrease their loss? Um, so how do we answer these types of questions? And when you look at all these different these uh, factors that are involved in phosphorus loss, you say, you know, we've done a lot of research, 20, 30 years, about phosphorus loss. What are the processes? What are the mechanisms? How do we integrate all that information of 30 years and all that data into a, a way that, that producers can make decisions, policymakers can make decisions? Is how do we make sense of it all in an effective, effective uh, sort of efficient, rapid way? So one of our options is models. Um, so there's, there's a good case for models. There's a good justification for models. Um, one of them is just due to the sheer number of important physical and management interactions that exist in the landscape. You know, we can't go out and measure and monitor everywhere. We have to have a way to make estimates on places we, we can't get to because it's too expensive. I mean, to, to do a monitoring study, you know, three, four years, make sense of it. Another couple of years, and get the result, results. Are in, it could be five, six years before we make sense of one site. Um, as I said, models are effective, efficient ways to integrate a wide variety of field data to make decisions. When we look at future scenarios, climate change, when we start to look at the whole system, lots of things really interacting. You know, in some ways, it really gets to be really tough or almost impossible to address some of these questions without models. Um, and as scientists, and in a way, what I think is really valuable about models, some things we don't talk about too much, it really forces us to formalize and test our understanding of, this, of the system. Do we understand the system enough to be able to make a prediction about what its impact is? And if we don't, then that way we can identify what we don't know, what our data gaps are, we can work to, to improve that. But as you got to say, you know, models are simple representations of our understanding of reality, of reality, but also our understanding of what that reality is. So we can't capture all those complexities, or otherwise we just have a model that, that we can't even use. Um, and we can't capture a model what we don't know. And there's a lot of things that we don't know. So when we talk about things like runoff and hydrology, these are the, a lot of the, uh, the, the gaps in knowledge that, that we're trying to figure out. So what are some of our options? Um, some of the older models, and on one, one end of the spectrum, we have these complex models, models like SWAT, APETS, and AGNIPS. And I'm going to present these here, and I have a few slides after this to, to talk about these a little bit more. <coughs> on the other end of the spectrum, we have a, a simple risk management type of, of phosphorus index. Um, for a long time, I guess, those were our, what was available to us, sort of these two extremes. We're starting to see you know, more of uh, something, things in the middle. Um, there's sort of, we want to capture this, this uh, marriage between the, you know, it's user friendly, we can use it pretty easily, we don't have to be an expert in models. You know, these models are well tested, more a little more quantitative, uh, you know, put an adjective there. Something that, that we can make better decisions on maybe. So we look at the one end of the, the extreme, the complex phosphorus models, models like SWAT and and APEX. Um, these are daily time step models, so they'll, they'll track every day of the year. 
you know, and try, they'll do from one year to, you know, to as many years as the model do, 25, 30, 50 years. Um, they're field to watershed scale models, so they're really designed for, you know, large landscapes. They'll do quantitative predictions. They're going to tell you, you know, pounds per acre of, of loss. Um, and these are for, you know, TMDL style projects that we've heard about in uh, the EPA uh, presentations. They're process-based models. They try to get, you know, sort of fundamental process-based equations that make predictions. Um, they're spatially explicit, so they're going to say what's happening where in the landscape and try to simulate the, the connections physically in a GIS type of way um, what's happening on the landscape. Uh, so it's going to simulate hydrology and it's going to simulate, try to do more than one thing, multiple contaminant transports, nutrients, pesticides. Um, you know, we'll mix, start mixing in air quality in some of these models. But since you have this complexity, you know, you have, it's data intensive. You're going to need a lot of data to, to set up the model. It's going to need daily rainfall data or, or even finer. Um, you know, this, these are not models you pull off the shelf and start running in an hour or so. It's, it's really, you know, you got to, it, it, to do one of these TMDL projects, I mean, it's a long time to set up a simulation like this. You got to know what you're doing. You got to have a lot of skill and experience to run these models. They need to be calibrated, which means that, you know, there's a lot of things you can tweak with the inputs. So you, you try to have a data set, you get the model running, it, it seems to simulate well for that, for that condition, and then you can test it with some, with some new data. So that's, they need to be calibrated. Um, and they really require a dedicated support system for updating and development. You know, you need to have a team of people that somebody's going to, you can go to because you don't, you have a problem with the model, you need some, some, some expertise, or you've identified a problem with the model that needs to be fixed. The other end extremes, we have our, our p-indexes, which we've, uh, Andrew talked about. You know, these are more annual time step, they're field scale, so they're not really beyond the field scale. It's a relative ranking of risk of phosphorus loss. It's very good for producer policy education. Um, they're not data intensive. Uh, you don't need a lot of experience or modeling skills to, to uh, to run these. Um, you don't need the calibration. Um, a lot of the, the things that while these are very much based on on the science and everything that's been done over the last 20 to 30 years, you know, they don't use the same equations as these process-based models will. Um, some of the weightings, how we weight, you know, how much is lost in the, in the, with the water versus erosion, some of these weighting factors are, are based on professional judgment. Some of these indexes have had testing generally. The, the field testing has been, hasn't been done on a lot of them throughout the country um, to verify, you know, <laughs> do they give good predictions of this, rel even this relative ranking, this field is worse than this. So we look at the, the sort of this newer trend of models, user-friendly quantitative models. Um, so these are models that estimate in a pounds per acre annual field scale phosphorus loss. Um, they, they have sort of moderate data requirements. They'll have a mix of, of databases, maybe databases from the soil in your state or county. Um, and then you need inputs into your, into your user management. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it requires a fair bit of data, but a lot of it may be, may be hardwired into the model. You know, the, the skill and experience they get again is, is to try to get it only at a moderate, uh, uh, level that you need. So we try to use the same process-based equations that are in these more complex models. Um, and we're really just trying to base that just on the experimental data, trying to get rid of the professional judgment about, you know, generally in my experience this is worse than this, so we'll give this a factor or two, this will be a one. You know, we want to base that just on what our measurements say. But they're not spatially explicit, they're not going to, um, look at the connection from, you know, woods, the water coming out of the woods through the field as we heard at uh, Joe, Joe Bagger's farm. But, you know, you're able to test this, and I've, this has been my experience, you're able to test this with a wide amount, a lot of data that's available in the literature. I can take a, a publication from, from a journal, it's going to tell me, I, you know, we did these things in this field, this is the phosphorus loss we measured, we had the run, this runoff, this erosion, I can put all that through the model, and I can see, you know, is my model giving me the, the good ranking of, of a good prediction of what was measured in these, uh, in these studies. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the model that 
that I've been working on. Some of these um, equations have, have gone into the Wisconsin uh, p-index. Um, this is one of the, the option models we're talking about for helping to maybe improve and, and test some of the indexes around the country. You can download this model. It's available on our Madison, Wisconsin, ARIS website. There's the model. There's a user manual. There's a, some theoretical documentation that, that explains all the equations. So this is an Excel spreadsheet model that estimates in pounds per acre annual field scale, dissolved sediment peat loss, and surface runoff, so no leaching or, or subsurface transport. So it's for a given set of management, soil phosphorus erosion, and runoff conditions. So it's intended to be process-based like SWOT or APEX, use that same type of understanding of uh, processes and those sorts of equations, but try to make it user-friendly like a, like a p-index. This is what the input screen looks like. Um, we have soil properties. It'll simulate two layers in the, in the topsoil. So that's where you know, we can start to look at soil phosphorus stratification if, with no-till soils. You need to tell it what's your soil test P, what's your clay and organic matter. Um, these transport factors, these are inputs, rain, runoff, and sediment. So you know, while uh, you know, some of the models will predict these things, the more complex models, even in the, in the p-index, you're going to get this prediction out of Russell 2. You're going to feed it into the p-index equation. So, you know, this is set up so you can sort of, and I'll show some examples in a little bit, how you can play with some of these numbers and see what, see what impact they have. You have crop P export, and you have um, phosphorus applications. So uh, what's your animals if you have grazing, manure applications for different uh, each season, how much manure is applied, solids content, uh, how much phosphorus is in there, how much of that phosphorus is in a a soluble form or a water extractable form that's more available for loss and runoff. Uh, how much did you incorporate? Same sort of information for, uh, for fertilizers. This is the kind of output we get right now. The model is set up that you can download it. It'll do a 10-year simulation. So it'll give you output on your total phosphorus loss, but then how much of that total is sediment P from erosion? How much is dissolved phosphorus loss from your soil or your manure? And it'll also look at changes in soil phosphorus over that 10 years. Um, so in your top, so if you, let's say you wanted to simulate a one inch layer in your soil and then six, isn't, six inches underneath, well, it'll, it'll say what's the changes in phosphorus in that one inch layer, you know, in that six inch layer underneath of that, and then just as a, in that whole seven inch layer um, in, integrated. So that's what the, the kind of output we get. I really wanted to try to do with this model, really try to test it a lot, you know, get as much data as I can from the literature, run it through this thing, say, you know, I really, I really want to see that this is, this is, it's not, you know, it's not hitting every number exact, but we're really going to, if, if we've measured a low loss, it's going to say it's a low phosphorus loss. Now there again, I'm in inputting the measured runoff and, er and erosion into this. So this, these have been a lot of tests of, are we getting the phosphorus part right of it? Or if we know, if we have a good idea of our runoff and erosion, the phosphorus we're saying is going along, is that, is that, is that right? So we've done, you know, for the phosphorus loss and runoff, we've had data from 28 um, crop studies from 13 states, even some international studies. That was a 2009 paper we had. More recently, we've looked at uh, just grazing. We've had data from 14 studies from five states and internationally, too. So one of my experiences in this process is, you know, there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of phosphorus loss data that we've been measuring through the years. You know, with these types of models, you can get at that easily. You can run it. You can test it. You can, you can really do some good evaluation, I think. We've done, tried to do a similar job with the soil phosphorus dynamics how we uh, simulate changes in soil phosphorus at time. We've had 19 different studies uh, that they monitored, monitored changes in soil phosphorus, you know, with that shallow layer and deeper layers too, um, for anywhere from one year up to almost 30 years, 29 years I think was the, was the highest. So we have a recent paper that, that shows our testing the model for that. We're also trying to, to uh, do some current updates to the model. We're trying to get a version that looks at barnyards and feedlots for phosphorus loss and then 
Really, uh, Carl Bolshar, I've been working with him. He's with ARS in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, uncertainty estimates, you know, okay, we, we predict a number, but let's, let's give him an evaluation how, how sure we are about that number. I wanted to give a few examples of what I like about this model is that, you know, a guy like Joe Bragger, he, he knows his runoff and erosion. He's, he's measured it. Um, he can start playing with things like, well, what if I change how much manure I apply? What if the runoff goes up? What if the runoff goes down? I can see what this does quickly. In this spreadsheet, it's really fast. I mean, you just change that runoff. You look at the, look at the figure and see what happens. So I have six different cases here. Um, so the first case, we have you know, 50 parts per million soil test P, one ton of erosion, three inches of runoff, we're applying manure on the surface, uh, you know, dairy manure, at, uh, liquid manure, 45 pounds of P per year. You know, we're, we're down less than two pounds per acre runoff. Um, case two, if I, if I start to increase my erosion and runoff, I'm doubling those, same soil test P, same manure, you know, this is what it's doing to my phosphorus loss. But there again, we can see as we're increasing runoff and erosion, we can start to see you know, how much is it? Okay, we know that if we increase runoff and erosion, we're going to increase our phosphorus loss. What I like about this is, you know, it can, it can say how much. Is it 10%? Is it, is it doubling? Um, there again, we can say, well, let's keep all these three <coughs> scenarios, but let's just change. Let's double our soil test phosphorus. You know, what does that do then? These three situations compared to these, if we just, we have a higher soil test P. We can look at situations like, what if I want to feed less, less phosphorus to my cows? So um, if we have three tons of erosion, six inches of runoff, these, these are high values. Um, if we're, we're spreading manure. Okay, if I'm feeding my cows 0.5% phosphorus in the feed, if I want to knock that down to 0.3, in the model I can say, okay, my manure now has less phosphorus, has less dissolved phosphorus, or water extractable phosphorus in it. I can see what does this do to my Phosphorus loss through time, my changes in my soil test phosphorus loss through time. You know, in this one, you estimate, you can do this really fast, you know, 9% less phosphorus loss over that 10 years, 20% less phosphorus in the soil. So you can get, you know, we know it's going to be less if you feed less phosphorus. How much less? You know, you can start to get maybe a better idea of how much less. There's another example. Um, again, we have 1.5 tons erosion. Uh, five inches of runoff, spreading manure at that same rate. We have a no-till field where we're spreading manure on the surface for the first 15 years, and then we, and then we stop. And we want to see how long it takes we, to bring their, our soil phosphorus back down. You know, what's my phosphorus loss that, that goes along with those changes in my soil phosphorus? Or what if I applied uh, the same amount of manure, but I apply it once um, every four years? I till it in. Um, you know, instead of applying that, that amount... Uh, at 45 every year, I apply 180 one year, the next three years don't get any. You know, I can look at my phosphorus loss and then the difference in that management and my soil test P. So you can see, you know, here we might get up to 200 in our no-till system um, applying every year. If we till it in every once every four years, maybe we can stay down to 150. We're not going to eliminate our accumulation but maybe we can, we can keep it a little bit lower. So you can start to quantify some things like that. And what's nice is these are really fast. I mean, you can do this in a few minutes to look at these different scenarios. So in, in the summary, you know, models are an effective way to integrate all the data that we have in our research um, to meet the demand for management and impact information quickly, cheaply. Um, they vary in complexity and appropriate uses. It's not always easy to know which one to choose, you know, how to, how to set up the inputs, how to use the outputs. You know, that takes some experience. Um, some of our newer models, I think, um, you know, we're, we're able to capture our current science. We're able to keep them up to date. You know, what's our, really our understanding of, of the system right now? We're able to balance the versatility, user friendliness with some of the complexity that, that we have in, in some of our uh, are more process-based models. You know, I, I, we heard uh, Dennis's, and I appreciate Dennis's uh, in, uh, position. You know, I, I think in a lot of ways, and I've come to think that, you know, models are really indispensable. I think, I think there's a real value in that when they're used well. Um, but they need to be well-developed, well-tested. They need to have support. 
to, to keep them that way from policy, from, from, uh, from scientists, you know, and, and make sure, and I'm always interested in, in input from producers, you know, what do you think of this? What, is this useful? Is this what you need? Is this what you, you can use? You know, how can we make it better? So I, that's uh, what I have. So I, if there's a couple minutes for questions. Thank you, Peter.